Chapter Sixteen of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bess, the detective. In this way, Saxon was purged from one undesirable person. Herrick was pleased that he had acted with such promptitude. Bess would no longer be vexed by the odious attentions of the little scamp who had tormented her. Doctor Jim smiled to think how much of the jealous rival there was about his dealings with his quondam friend. He now recognized that Bess was the woman he desired for his wife, nor did he think that she would refuse to become Mrs. Herrick when he could give her a home worthy of her. Had she disliked his attentions, she would not have permitted even the strange hour's wooing, which was all they had of love since Jim had found his heart. He laughed at the recollection. To talk of love between intervals of detective analysis, he thought, as he walked back to Saxon, having sent on Napper's cart by the groom, is a strange way of wooing one's wife, and the last kind I expected to indulge in. But Bess enjoyed it, I fancy. I must recompense myself in a more leisurely way when this business is at an end. On arriving at Saxon, the doctor called in at the car arms to see Don Manuel. He wanted to hear from the man himself if he had really given the pistol to Joyce, and if so, how it had come into his possession. It might be that he had bought it in order to incriminate Robin, although at present Herrick could see no very good reason for such incrimination. On the other hand, the pistol might be the veritable weapon used to shoot Carr, but that could be proved only by the test of the bullet and he would have to wait until Bess saw Bridge about that. In some way Herrick felt convinced that Santiago was connected with the crime. He had known and hated Carr, and he was too intimate with Joyce for mere friendship, and he showed too great a desire to remain in the parish. That he should have in some way gained possession of the real pistol was not unlikely, and it might be that he used it himself, said Dr. Jim, as he entered the inn although I should think he would have used a more modern weapon for choice. On speaking to Napper about the Mexican, a shock awaited him. The landlord expressed the broadest surprise that Mr. Joyce had not told Dr. Herrick of Santiago's departure. The Mexican had gone to London by an early train. Herrick swore beneath his breast, feeling that he had been outwitted. When Mr. Joyce came back here this afternoon, did he see Don Manuel? I, sir, bet he did. The foreigner was waiting for him, and they talked for an hour. After that, Don Manuel came down with his trunk. He had but one, doctor, and drove in to catch an earlier train. To Beerminster? asked Herrick. No, sir, to Heathcroft. He paid his bill all right, though. But I was astonished Mr. Joyce left us so suddenly. There is nothing wrong, I hope. By no means, replied Herrick, with a carelessness that he was far from feeling. I believe Don Manuel had to go up on business, and asked Mr. Joyce to join him later. Will they be coming here again, sir? asked Napper, and on receiving a reply in the negative, expressed his regret. They didn't pay much, but they was sure, said the worthy landlord. Did you hear Senor Santiago say where he was going? asked Herrick. But this the landlord could not tell him. Dr. Jim walked away annoyed that he had been taken in. He felt that Robin had been tutored to play his part by the cleverer scoundrel. No doubt Robin had told the Mexican of his intrusion into the case, and Santiago had taken alarm. He knew well enough that Dr. Jim would recognize the pistol and that he would force Robin to say where he had obtained it. Evidently Don Manuel thought it would be better for him to disappear than to face an examination. Yet he could have told Joyce to make up some story about the pistol so that he might not be brought into it. The whole business was part of the conspiracy. Don Manuel was in it, Robin also, and Herrick felt that the firm of Joyce and Santiago had been one too many for him. All the same, he remembered that he had set a watch on Joyce, 
If this camp tried to hide or went to any place to meet Manuel, he would be followed. I shall go up to town tomorrow, said Herrick, on his way to the Pines. Wherever Joyce has gone, there Manuel will be. I shall run them both to earth and learn what all this means by questioning them in each other's company. They won't trick me a second time. Well, I have done enough detective work for the day. I'll think of something else. Stephen was now so far on the road to recovery that he was able to leave his room. He had seen little of Jim lately, but he did not miss him, thanks to the constant attendance of Ida. Marsh Carr was as devoted a friend as ever to Herrick. He still believed him the cleverest and best of men, but now his whole heart was filled with the image of Ida. The two were constantly together, and the girl had no small share in nursing back her promised husband to health. The wound in the head had mended, and the blow had left no effect behind it beyond an occasional headache. Stephen never gave his assailant a thought. He quite forgot Carr's tragic death and all the strange circumstances which had brought about his change of fortune. At times he even ceased to remember his stepmother, much as he had loved her. All his thoughts were for Ida, and with her he passed hours planning their future. They never talked of the past, and noticing this, Herrick forbore to tell his friend that he was still working to discover the murderer of Colonel Carr, and striving to baffle a possible conspiracy that had for its aim the loss to Stephen, not only of the Carr fortune, but possibly also his life. Jim felt quite competent to deal with the matter himself, and did not think it necessary to spoil Marsh Carr's love-making with such commonplace things. Therefore, he remained in ignorance of Herrick's doings. "'How late you are,' said Stephen, who was already dressed for dinner. "'I have been anxiously expecting you this last hour.' "'I had to go in the Beelminster,' said Herrick, carelessly. "'Joyce has been called up to town, and I went to see the last of him.' "'I'm glad he has gone,' Stephen said gravely. "'I don't like him. I think he is false. As for the Mexican, he shrugged his shoulders.' Herrick, who was pouring himself a glass of sherry as an appetizer, turned with a laugh. The Mexican is a bad lot, sure enough, he said. As to Joyce, he is more of a fool than a knave. I forgot that he was your friend. You do quite right to use the past tense, Steve. He was my friend, but he is so no longer. Herrick laughed again and sipped his sherry. I have taken you for a chain. "'You know well that I will never fail you,' said Stephen warmly. "'No, I suppose we shall remain good friends till you marry. "'Then you will forget me and think only of your wife.' "'You know better than that, Jim. "'Besides, Ida is fond of you.' "'I know. "'I was fond of Ida, too, at one time. "'But that was before she was engaged to you. "'But I have not played you false, Steve.' "'You are telling me old news,' replied Marsh Carr, smiling. "'I saw that you were in love with Ida.' "'No, I was never in love. I thought I was. "'But my love was a snare and a delusion. "'But you thought so, did you? Were you not jealous?' "'Not at all. I knew that Ida was mine, and I trusted her. You, too.' "'Wonderful man,' said Herrick, looking into the fire. "'Well, you did right to trust us both. We are merely friends now. Indeed, I know we never were anything else. I was blind, but she was not. However, I am glad that you two are engaged. You will be happy. And when am I to congratulate you? At this very minute, if you like. It is best you are talking of. Stephen sat up on the sofa, looking astonished. Yes, he said. Ida saw that she was in love with you. Ida is a clever woman. She prophesied my love would come suddenly. Bess has not yet formally consented to be my wife, but I think it will be all right. I am more than delighted. We shall be brothers-in-law. And you will always stay here, Jim. Living on you, my dear fellow? No, 
I shall start practice again in town, when I have got together sufficient money. Then, when I am doing fairly well, Bess shall come to me and supplement my income by writing novels in the intervals of looking after the house. Herrick, you must not go away. You promised. Until you were married. But be of good cheer, Steve. I won't leave you until everything is right. Dr. Jim said these last words with a significance which was lost on his listener. I thought that your friend Joyce... Oh, he never had a chance. I was a fool to let him hang after Bess. However, I found out today what she was to me. So it is all right now. Bess and Ida are coming over this evening with Frank. All the better. I can make my proposal in due form. By the way, Steve, I'm going up town tomorrow, if you can spare me. Certainly, but it is not to make arrangements to leave me, is it? I should think not. I shall never go until you tell me, Steve. No, I'm going to see about some business of my own. Well, I must dress. I hope you have a good dinner for me. I'm very hungry. You think of nothing but eating, said Stephen, with a laugh. The dinner gave every satisfaction, even to Herrick, who was somewhat fastidious. But Ida had seen that a good cook was engaged, and the two men had nothing to complain of. Dinner over, Herrick supported Stephen into the library, and placed him on the sofa. Then he sat beside him, and they smoked over their coffee and cognac. But you must go to bed at half-past ten, said Herrick sternly. What a tyrant you are, Jim. Hark, there are the girls. They came in looking charming, and in the best of spirits. It needed but a glance for Dr. Jim to see that Bess had said nothing about Joyce to her brother or sister. What a wise little woman she was. When Ida and Frank had seated themselves beside Stephen, Jim drew her into a remote corner of the room. "'You said nothing about our adventure today,' he whispered. "'No,' she replied, in the same tone. "'I thought it best not to. "'And, Mr. Joyce, you'll not be troubled with him again. "'He has gone to town. "'I do not think he will come back. "'Santiago has gone also. "'What about his threat against me?' "'That is all right. "'I have his confession in my pocket. "'Did he kill Colonel Carr? "'No.' I have not yet solved that problem, but do not let us talk of these unpleasant things any more, Bess. Tomorrow you shall know all. In the meantime, make yourself agreeable to me and tell me how much you love me. Come now, after this afternoon, you cannot deny. I neither deny nor affirm, said Bess, her face one glow of scarlet. But that might have been the fire. You are not in earnest today. Indeed I was. Can't you see that I love you with my whole heart and soul? I never knew until today how much I did love you. I thought it was Ida, faltered Bess. I thought so, too, for a period of madness. But I know now that I was mistaken. We are the best of friends, as you can see. But you have not replied to my question. What do you want me to say? That I'm the dearest man in the world? and that you have loved me for ever so long. Come now. It is true, said Bess, sinking her voice. I have loved you, I do love you, and I am thankful to be your wife. I am a poor doctor, remember. I love you for yourself, not for any money you may have. Faith, said Herrick, that is lucky for me. Come here. Behind this screen, there now. Oh, Dr. Jim, no. Very well. Jim without the doctor. Do not go on like this. We are not alone. You will come into another room, teased Jim. Certainly not. Jim, what are you doing? Leading you into the world, said Herrick, laughing. Bess laughed also, and blushed, when Jim led her before the three astonished people who looked at them in amazement. Ladies and gentlemen, said Dr. Jim, do you know who this is? Bess, I suppose, said the stupid brother. And more than that, cried Ida, rising to take her sister in her arms. Oh, Bess, darling, I'm so glad. Hurrah, cried Stephen, and pinched Frank's arm. 
The youth was still dense, although the truth was staring him in the face. He looked at the two girls almost weeping with pleasure in one another's arms, at the laughing faces of Herrick and Stephen. Still he did not understand, not having yet experienced the love of a woman. "'You are stupid, Frank,' cried Ida. "'Can't you see?' "'Can't you see?' said Herrick, gripping Frank's arm. "'What a blind brother-in-law I shall have!' "'Oh!' Frank's eyes opened wide. "'Are you to marry Bess?' Herrick nodded. "'And Stephen takes Ida?' The engaged couple laughed. "'Well,' said Frank, "'that is two of them gone. And who is to look after Biffstead?' "'Flo, of course,' said Stephen. "'As if she could. Bess is the top tail and bottom of the house.' "'That she is,' cried Ida, hugging her sister. "'And I am jealous of Jim, taking her away from us.' Then she gave Herrick a roguish glance. "'Was I not right?' she asked. "'Perfectly right,' he replied, and drew Bess down on the seat beside him. Ida went as by instinct to Stephen. Only the miserable Frank was left out in the cold and said so. The quartet laughed heartlessly. There was not a happier party in the whole three kingdoms than that seated before the fire in the house of the wicked Colonel Carr. If the shade of the old man had been present in the room, he must, or rather it must, have sighed enviously at the sight of such happiness. Not during his reign had such truth and honor and clean delight prevailed in the old house. It was a merry evening. Memory of the Golden Age, said Jim. The next morning Dr. Herrick re-entered the workaday world. He walked over the Biffstead and found Bess just setting out for Beelminster on her bicycle. You can leave that, he said, after a kiss had been exchanged. I will drive you over to Beelminster in the cart. I told the groom to put in the horse and bring it round here. You are going to town, asked Bess. Yes on the track of those two scamps. You are going to see Bridge about the bullet? Yes, I have the pistol in my pocket, she replied, showing it. Very good. Can you drive the cart back? Of course I can. Drive? Who ever heard of asking a country girl such a question? You do not know my accomplishments, Jim. I know that you are the dearest and sweetest and most sensible girl in the whole wide world. But I say we won't take the groom. In the first place, I want you all to myself. In the second, I must tell you all that took place when I interviewed Joyce yesterday. Bess, needless to say, thought this was a capital idea. So when the groom brought round the cart, he was sent away. He saw the pair drive toward the village, and there was a broad grin on his face. He knew very well what they were to one another. In some mysterious way, the news had got to the servants' hall and had been well discussed that very morning. The lovers drove into Beerminster and talked in the most matter-of-fact way about the conspiracy. Their heads were so close together that one would have thought they were exchanging the tenderest confidences. In place of that, the detective fever was raging in both their breasts and they were like a couple of Scotland Yard officials. Then Herrick took a last farewell, promised to return in the course of a few days, and caught the express. When the train disappeared round the curve, Bess went back to the cart and drove it to some stables where she put it up. Afterwards, she went into the lower part of Beelminster, where Mr. Inspector Bridge had his office. He happened to be in and brightened up when he saw her. Bridge had a great opinion of the younger Miss Endicott. "'What good wind brings you here, miss?' he asked. "'Ah,' said Bess solemnly, "'that requires some telling, Mr. Inspector. "'It is about this pistol,' and she produced it from her pocket. "'Pistol?' echoed Bridge, puzzled. "'Ah, is it the pistol of the car case?' "'That is what I want to find out,' said Miss Endicott who had her story all ready to tell, and had discussed its details with Dr. Jim during the drive. I found this the other day in the pine wood near Colonel Carr's house. It is a clumsy old-fashioned thing, 
but I remembered what was said about the bullet being old-fashioned also. Now I want you to see if the bullet fits the muzzle of this. Hmm, said Bridge, with his most important air, looking down the muzzle. So you found this pistol in the grass, and near the house. Perhaps, I say perhaps, mind you, Miss Bess, this might be the weapon we have been looking for so long. Is there a name on the butt? No, said Bess promptly. You only find that in novels. There is not so much as a scratch on the handle. An old weapon, observed Bridge, wagging his head ponderously and irritating Bess to a frenzy with his platitudes. Well, we must see if the bullet... Ah, yes, the bullet. Now, where is it? Bridge went hunting over some shelves. Then he took to excavating in drawers, opened the safe, dug under dusty piles of paper, and suddenly produced, Bess never saw from where, a small box in which something rattled. When he opened this, there were three conical bullets and one flat round one. Ah, cried Bess, there it is. Try, please, Mr. Inspector. All in good time, miss, said the aggravating bridge, and dropped the bullet into the muscle. It disappeared, and he nodded solemnly. It is the pistol, he said. You have made a valuable discovery, miss. If there was only a name or initials on the handle, he sighed. Bess was not attending to him. She took the pistol and dropped out the bullet, then rammed it home again, and nodded in her turn. There's no doubt of it, she said. This, the pistol, that shot Colonel Carr. You will leave it with me, miss, asked Bridge. I might find out something likely to lead to the detection of the assassin. Bess laughed delightedly. From that last phrase she knew that Inspector Bridge had been reading detective fiction of the worst. She knew also that the pistol would afford no clue to the truth until it was in capable hands. Therefore, as she thought it would be safer, in the Bureau Mr. Police Office, than in the untidy house of Biffstead, where everybody was always turning over everybody else's drawers, she consented that Bridge should take charge of it. The inspector, with an important air, put away the pistol in his safe. He was about to replace the box when he noticed that Bess had the round bullet in her hand. Come, miss, give it back, he said. Belongs to the crown, that does. A queer bullet, murmured Bess, made in a mold. Here is the seam. I do not believe it is lead. It is too hard for lead. Have you a penknife, Mr. Inspector? Ah, she seized one lying on the desk. This will do. I don't believe this is lead. Nonsense, said Bridge crossly. All bullets are made of lead. This is not, cried Bess, who was scratching away vigorously. See how hard it is, and the scratches shine. Inspector Bridge, she said in a solemn tone, I believe this is silver. It can't be. The inspector took it up and examined it in his turn. What Bess said was true. The bullet was hard, not soft as lead should be, and moreover, it was hard to scratch. And the little scraping she had given it glittered in parts just like silver. It might be, murmured Bridge. There's a silversmith just round the corner, said Bess, in great excitement. Do come, and let's him see it. I want to know for certain that it is silver. I do not know what good that will do, Miss Bess. If it is silver, that will not help us catch Frisco any sooner. No, but you can't think what discoveries you might make if you know it was silver for certain. I know how you can put things together, and a piece of evidence like this. Oh, I am sure you could do a lot with it. Bridge in his own heart did not very well see what he could do, but he was not proof against flattery, as the artful Bess well knew. So he went round the corner with her to a convenient jeweler's and offered him the bullet. Will you please tell me what this is, he said, in his most official tone. Do not destroy it, Mr. Blinks, or deform it in any way. It is the property of the crown. All the crown wants to know is the metal of which this is formed. Mr. Blinks was much impressed with his speech. 
Promising to be careful, he took the bullet into the next room, into his workshop, and there performed some trick of the trade. When he returned, he handed the bullet to Bridge, very little altered. It is of silver, Mr. Bridge, he said. All of silver, asked Bridge, while Bess tried to suppress her excitement. All of silver, Mr. Bridge. It has been cast in a mold, probably a cup or a silver plate has been melted down. What is it, Mr. Inspector? The property of the Crown, replied Bridge solemnly, and departed. When in the office, he locked up the bullet and looked at Bess. I really do not see how this discovery can help me, he said. Think it over, Mr. Inspector. You will be certain to hit upon some link. But Bess herself was as far away from the truth as the Inspector. As she drove back to Saxon, she wondered how it came about that the bullet which had killed Carr was cast in silver, and to this she could find no answer. End of chapter 16"'Chapter 17 of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. "'This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. "'Unexpected Evidence. "'The surprising discovery that the bullet was of silver "'elevated the crime from the commonplace to the romantic. "'That an old-fashioned weapon should have been used in these days "'when firearms have reached such a pitch of perfection was remarkable enough, but that the assassin should have reverted to the superstitions of the Middle Ages for his missile was almost beyond belief. In spite of her quick brain, Bess could not come to any decision. Failing a discussion with Dr. Jim, she resolved to leave the vexed question at rest. All the same, she did not pause in her detective work. Having followed up one clue until it ended, for the time being, in nothing, she hunted about for another. So far, she had made two discoveries. The pistol which Joyce declared he had received from Don Manuel was certainly the weapon with which the murder had been committed, and the bullet was of silver. But this knowledge resulted in nothing. Certainly, it cast a strong suspicion on the Mexican, but that part of the puzzle best felt she could safely leave to Herrick. So far as her particular business was concerned, she could do no more until she heard her colleague's report. Pending this, she began to work in a different direction. It occurred to her that she had never questioned Sidney about his doings in the pine wood on the night of the murder. Possibly he might be able to supply some clue to the mystery. He was in the habit of watching the tower, said Bess to herself. He said as much on that day when we had the picnic. I wonder if he saw anything suspicious on that night. Then he might have seen that horrid little Joyce, or perhaps Frisco. I'll see what he knows. Sidney was not an easy person to question. His fantasies of thought had been laughed at so frequently, the truth of his statements so often denied, that he had grown reticent. What he saw, what he heard, he kept to himself, and not even his own family could get him to explain himself on occasions when they really desired information. The boy mooned about in a dreamy state of mind, saying little beyond the merest commonplaces, and for the most part lived in the world of fantasy, which was an anatha maranatha, to the people around him. He was like a wild animal, shy, timid, and intensely suspicious. Bess thought he might be more open with her when he was, so to speak, in his native wilds. She therefore watched her opportunity and followed him to one of his favorite haunts in the pine wood, where it fringed the moor. Here one afternoon she found him seated in a secluded glade beside one of those remarkable circles which the country people call fairy rings. So steadily was he gazing at this, in the half-light which filtered through the overhead boughs, that he did not notice her approach. To be sure, she trod softly, and used the same precautions as she would have done when approaching the haunt of some timid animal. 
Sidney had always been a puzzle to everyone, but Bess understood him better than most people. Besides, she had discussed him frequently with Santiago, and was inclined to take the Mexican's view of the boy's peculiarities, remembering the oft-quoted saying of Hamlet. Bess was less skeptical than those around her. She could not see why Sidney should not possess the power of seeing, what in the generally accepted sense is called the unseen. Considering what the lad had foretold with regard to the death of Mrs. Marsh and the accident to her stepson, it was impossible to say that Sidney was either a fool or a madman. There was some reason for his fantasies, so called, and Bess regarded him with a certain amount of awe. She could not understand him, but she granted that he was a rare spirit, far removed from the commonplace mortal. "'Well, Thomas the Rhymer,' said Bess gaily, when her shadow fell on the fairy ring, "'are you looking for the Queen of Elfland?' It was characteristic of Sidney that he was never taken by surprise. At the sound of her voice he neither started nor expressed any anger. All he did was to raise his serious eyes to her face and observe quietly, "'I knew you were coming, Bess, dear.' She threw herself down beside him and nodded towards the fairy ring. "'Did they tell you?' she asked in a low tone, and in all good faith. "'No, Bess, this is not the time for the little people to be abroad. I was only looking at their dancing ground.' "'Have you seen them here?' Often, replied Sidney, with conviction, small naked folk who dance and sing and play on queer instruments. They know that I see them, but they are not angry. I believe you are a fairy yourself, Sidney. No, I have a soul, what you call a soul, and the fairies have none. They are only the creatures who attend to the works of nature, her servants. I see them because... Here Sidney broke off. It is no use my telling you, Bess, you would not understand. Bess quite admitted this. She could not understand. All the same, she did not tell her brother that he was a fool, as many people would have done. She simply nodded and passed the subject by. Her errand was to find out what Sidney had seen in the actual world. After the manner of her sex, she approached the matter by a side issue. "'Sidney, dear,' said she, "'do you know that Mr. Joyce has gone away to London?' "'No, I did not,' replied Sidney gravely. "'But I am glad he has gone. A bad man, Bess, and he would have done you harm.' "'How? What do you mean?' Sidney passed his hand across his face. "'I cannot explain,' he said in a troubled voice. "'You see, Bess, bad people carry about with them a bad atmosphere.' That Mexican was very wicked, Joyce not so bad. Both of them made me feel quite ill. Did you never see how I refused to sit beside them? Well, that was because they gave me such pain. Not physical pain, but a kind of uncomfortable feeling, which I can't put into words. In what an old-fashioned way you talk, Sidney, said Bess, puzzled. One would think you were a hundred. I know more than I say. Corn did not teach me everything I know. Tell me, Sidney, do you like Mr. Corn? I do, in a way. He is not bad, but he is weak. With good people he is good. With bad people he is bad. I am glad that Don Manuel has gone to town. He was doing Mr. Corn a lot of harm. But if I have told you what I know of these things, you would only laugh at me. No, I would not, Sidney, said his sister earnestly. I am sure that you are so sensitive that you feel these influences you talk about. Sensitive, echoed Sidney. Yes, I suppose that is what you would call it. You have come here to ask me a question, he said abruptly. How do you know, she demanded. Then seeing him shrug his thin shoulders, she admitted the truth of what he said. I want to ask you who you saw in the pine wood on the night when Colonel Carr was killed. Sidney thought for a moment, then raised his eyes toward the gap in the trees formerly blocked by the tower. 
I saw a lot of red mist about the tower, he said. That was anger. I saw, too. He shook his head impatiently. It is not these things you wish to know, Bess. I want to know who killed Colonel Carr. I can't tell you, Bess, if I knew I should tell, but I don't. On that night I came here looking for things, said Sidney, with a side glance to see if she were laughing. And although I felt that there was a bad influence about the house, I never went near it. I kept away and wandered on to the moor. That is why you missed me when you came to look for me. I did not mind the rain, but I saw your lantern and thought you would be anxious, so I returned home. Then you came back yourself. Yes, that is all true. But tell me, Sidney, did you see Mr. Joyce in the wood or on the moor? No, I did not see him. Stephen was the only person I saw. Bess started violently. Stephen, she said. Surely you must be mistaken. No, replied the boy indifferently. Why should I be mistaken? You know I can see in the dark like a cat. Before I saw your lantern, I had seen Stephen on the lawn looking at the tower. I do not know what time it was, so don't ask me. You are always so particular about time, said Sidney peevishly, as though it mattered. Bess reflected. It was strange that Stephen should have been in the vicinity of the house that night, and yet have escaped her notice. But she remembered that being intent upon looking for her brother, that she had not even seen Joyce, although he was lurking in the bushes at her elbow. True, she had caught a glimpse of Frisco, but that was when she consciously looked at the door. It was possible that Sidney might have come across Stephen. Did you speak to him? she asked. No, why should I have spoken to him? Did he go into the house? Not that I saw, Bess. He was looking up at the tower, standing on the lawn by the trees. I went to the other side of the wood and out on to the moor. That is all I know. But, Sidney, did you see Frisco crossing the moor? I did not. When I saw your lantern, I went home. I wish you would stop asking me questions, he cried irritably. You make my head ache. After this speech, he relapsed into one of his silent fits, and Bess could not get him to speak. Knowing from experience that Sidney was hopeless when in this mood, she left him still by the fairy ring, and took her way back to Biffstead. The house was empty, as Ida had gone to Beelminster to see Flo, and Frank was attending to the farm. Bess sat down and wondered what could be the meaning of Stephen's presence at the Pines on that night. She knew that he had come over from Beelminster to escort his mother home, but then Mrs. Marsh had been with Mr. Corn the whole evening, and there was no reason why Stephen should have gone out of his way to visit the Pines. It was in the afternoon that Mrs. Marsh had seen the Colonel, and Stephen must have known that she would not be at the great house after nine o'clock. This, best calculating by her own movements, was the hour at which Sidney had seen him. He was looking up at the tower, too, so Sidney said. But he can't have had anything to do with it, she thought restlessly. He disliked the Colonel, but he didn't. No, I won't even think of it. Such a thing, if true, would kill Ida. Yet I must find out from Stephen himself why he was in the wood on that night. She reflected. At this hour, Stephen would be alone. Why should she not go over and see him? In one way or another, she could tell him about the pistol and the silver bullet and see from the expression on his face if he knew anything about either. It was incredible that Stephen should have fired the shot he was the colonel's heir, but even to gain the money, he certainly was too good a man to commit a crime. Yet, if what Sidney said was true, Stephen had been on the lawn about the time Colonel Carr was shot. He must know something about the matter. I'll see him, said Bess, putting on her hat again. I shall not be able to sleep a wink until I know what he has to say. In another half hour, she was in the library where Stephen was established on the sofa. He looked thin and rather worried, but
but his face brightened when he saw her. "'This is good of you, Bess,' he said, stretching out his hand. "'I am all alone. Herrick is in town, Ida at Beominster. Not a soul to speak to. Draw that chair close to the fire. Shall I ring for tea?' It is too early yet, she said, reassured by this bright talk. It was incredible that a man who spoke so lightly should have a black crime on his soul. I just wanted to chatter for a bit. I'm so tired of my own company. So am I. Well, you talk about Jim, and I'll discourse about Ida. We shall be quite happy. By the way, when will Ida be back? About dinner time. She will come over and see you afterwards. I wish she would come to dinner here, said Stephen. You also, and Frank and Sidney. I miss Jim horribly, and it's no fun eating a long, solemn meal alone. Upon my word, Bess, I sometimes long for the days when Petronella's macaroni could be eaten hurriedly and without this formality. I would rather have a book than a footman about the table. "'What a mixed way of talking,' said Bess pensively. "'You have a book on the table as a rule. "'I suppose you are glad all the same that you have the Colonel's money.' "'Of course I am,' said Stephen frankly. "'It enables me to marry Ida. "'I was so afraid lest she should marry someone else before I came into my kingdom. "'But I could not ask her to be my wife when I was a pauper, could I, Bess?' She's a rare jewel that requires a rich setting. I don't think Ida values money so much as all that, said Bess gravely. She would have married you without a sixpence. But I am glad all the same that the money came to you so soon. It is nice to be rich. So it is, admitted Stephen gladly. I can buy whatever books I like. Bess laughed at this speech. I'm afraid you will grow into a bookworm. No, Jim has got me out of bad habits in that respect. At one time I did nothing but read. Now I ride and swim and box and fence and shoot. Bess started at the last word. It gave her the opening she desired. Are you a good shot, she asked. I was always a good shot, said Stephen coolly. That is, with a pistol. I never handled a gun until I came here. I did not know you had ever handled a pistol, either. Oh, yes, I did. Young Caprone gave me permission to shoot rabbits on his estate ages ago. I could not afford to buy a gun, but I did manage to get enough money to screw out a revolver, and a very good one. I believe it was brought here from Beominster, unless Petronella overlooked it, but I have not used it for over a year. Rabbit shooting with a pistol is not much fun, especially when one is alone. I should like to see the pistol, said Bess, after a pause. Go over, then, to the box behind that screen, said Stephen. If it's anywhere, it will be in there. There are all sorts of odds and ends, ragtag and bobtail, of my former existence. Bess did as she was told, and walked slowly over and behind the large gilded screen which stood in a far corner of the library. Here pushed to one side, was a moderately sized box, the lid of which was open. She found in it a few books, many manuscripts, pens and inkstand, and all the paraphernalia of a writing table. These she enumerated aloud. I know, said Stephen, from the sofa, those are the contents of my study. I expect Petronella threw all the things into that trunk. The pistol is bound to be there, in a small mahogany box. I always kept it on the mantelpiece of my study. Be careful. If you find it, Bess, all six chambers are loaded. After some search, Bess came across just such a box, and opened it to find a neat little revolver of the most modern pattern. She carried this, box and all, to the table near the sofa. Again Stephen warned her that the weapon was loaded. I kept it loaded because my mother was always afraid of thieves, poor soul, he said, though heaven knows there was little enough to steal in that dismal house of ours. What is it, Bess? There are only three chambers loaded, said Bess thickly. 
In a flash she remembered the three shots fired into the dead body, and the conical shape of the bullets. Those in the weapon she held were conical in shape. "'Nonsense,' said Stephen nervously. "'I always kept the whole six loaded. You must be making a mistake.' He took the revolver from her and examined it closely. "'You are right,' he said, with a long breath. Three of them are empty.' As he spoke, he looked up apparently with indifference. When his eye caught hers, he saw something in her expression which made him start and flush crimson. For a moment they looked at one another. Then Stephen swung himself up to a sitting position and laid the pistol on the side table. "'Why do you look at me like that, Bess?' he asked in a hurried tone. For a minute she did not reply, but she felt that she must know the truth and burst out hurriedly, "'Stephen, you were on the lawn on the night your uncle was killed?' The young man started to his feet and then fell back again on the sofa, white and amazed. "'How do you know?' he stuttered. "'Sidney saw you. He told me. Oh, Stephen, three chambers of your revolver empty, three shots at—' She felt suffocated and could not continue. "'Wait, wait!' Stephen put his hand to his head. It felt confused. His face was of a deep purple. Bess thought he would have a fit and blamed herself for having blurted out her suspicions. "'Wait, wait!' muttered Marsh Carr again, as she moved towards the bell to summon assistance. He sat down on the sofa, his face in his hands, rocking himself to and fro. Then he heaved a deep sigh and looked up at her white, haggard face. "'You will not tell Ida,' he said. With her hands twisted in her hair, Bess stepped back. She suppressed a shriek. Stephen, she cried hoarsely, you did not, you? I did not murder him, no, replied the young man harshly. He was already dead when I fired those three shots. Then it was you who? It was I, cried Stephen, rising to his feet with a fierce look. And you were going to denounce me, I suppose? No, no, how could you think I would do such a thing? But Ida, poor Ida, "'You must not tell her,' cried Stephen, grasping her wrist until she winced with the pain. "'Do what you like, but say nothing to Ida. I would rather break off our engagement on another plea than that she should know.' The pain of the twist he gave her arm brought Bess back to a more normal state of mind. She pulled herself together and sat down. "'Stephen,' she said slowly, "'no one but you and I will share this secret.' Can you swear to me that Colonel Carr was already dead when you fired those shots? I want the truth. He was already dead, said Marsh Carr, sitting down quietly. Did you not hear the medical evidence at the inquest? It was the bullet which killed him. My shots were fired at a carcass. Why did you do such a horrible thing, wailed Bess? Because I was mad for the time being, said Stephen gloomily. I will tell you all if you are strong enough to hear it. After what I know, I'm strong enough to hear anything. Oh, to think that you should have behaved in so barbarous a manner. Stephen winced. It was barbarous, I confess, said he, but I was mad for the time being. After all, you must not be too hard on me. I did not kill my respected uncle, he sneered. Bess shivered. She had never before seen this side of Stephen's character, and the new experience was unpleasant. It even stirred her into unconsidered indignation. Since you went up that tower with a revolver, you must have intended to kill the man, she said. Perhaps I did, perhaps I did not, he answered, in a most brazen manner. But the plain truth is that I wanted to frighten him. And did you think a revolver would frighten a man who has faced death fifty and a hundred times, said Bess with a scorn? She recalled to her memory several episodes Carr had told her of his American doings. She well knew the daredevilry latent in the man. Carr was old and he had lost his nerve. I counted upon that. I never intended to kill him. When I went up the tower, the work had been done for me already and who did it. 
I do not know, said Stephen earnestly. Upon my soul, Bess, I do not know. The man was dead when I saw him. It was sheer rage that made me fire those three shots. The brute that is in me, as it is in every man, came to the surface. But of the real murderer, I saw no trace. I did not see Frisco, whom I take to be the man. It was not Frisco, flashed out Bess. However, she continued sick at heart, you had better tell me how it came about. Partly through my love for Ida, partly through my mother, said Marsh Carr gloomily. It came to my mother's ears that the Colonel intended to disinherit me. I suppose Frisco got the upper hand and induced him to alter his will. That is, if he did alter it, which I doubt. Of course he did not, Stephen. If he had left the money to anyone else, you would not be here. I'm not so sure about that, replied the young man savagely. Frisco might have taken the second will from the corpse. At all events, I know that Firth and Firth drafted no new will. If it was drawn, the colonel must have drawn it himself. However, Frisco let out, in one of his drunken fits at Beelminster, that Carr intended to cut me off. My mother heard the news and came home in a frenzy of rage. It was for that reason she called on Carr on the afternoon you know of. The twenty-fourth, was it not? She intended to argue him into a better frame of mind. He only laughed at her and said he would leave his money as pleased him. She told me the next day, but Carr was dead then. What made you decide to frighten him? Am I not telling you, said Stephen impatiently? When my mother went to Saxon, I knew she would fail. A woman could not deal with a devil like my beloved uncle. I determined to see what I could do with a revolver. I would have fought a duel with him to keep my rights, said the young man fiercely, but I would not have killed him in cold blood. No, indeed. Well, go on, said Bess. I want to know all. There's little to tell, said Marsh Carr. I was going to Saxon to fetch home my mother, who was at the rectory. I thought I would visit the Pines and see the Colonel. I did so some time before nine. Ah, it was about that hour Sidney saw you. I dare say I stood on the lawn looking at the tower and could not make up my mind to enter the house. It was all ablaze with lights and quite deserted. No, said Bess, recalling her own experience. I heard you fire the shots and saw Frisco at the door. He was drunk and hanging on to the post. You heard me fire the shots. I did not know you were about. I was then. I had gone to look for Sidney. But you see, Frisco? It was Frisco, said Stephen, vehemently. I tell you Carr was dead when I went up, lying face downward. If Frisco was at the door, he was just clearing out after killing the man. He knew that he would be arrested. But he must have heard the shots. Then he knew that someone had discovered the body, which would make him run for it all the more quickly. However, to make a long story short, I fired the three shots you know of, and then returned to my mother at the rectory. I said nothing about the matter, as I had not killed Carr. If Frisco is not the murderer, I do not know who is. That is all I can tell you, Bess. You see, I am not such a guilty wretch as you thought. I know that, said Bess impetuously. If you were, I should insist upon your leaving Ida. The fire at the dead was savage, but, as I know the man must have been dead at the time, the medical evidence proves that. I will say nothing. Why did you not tell me of this before? What use would it have been, said Stephen, raising his eyebrows? I cannot tell you anything likely to lead to the capture of the assassin. And besides, it is not a pleasant thing to tell about myself. I should not have told you now, but that you have been one too many for me. I should have reloaded the three chambers of that revolver, but I forgot and put it away thinking all six were loaded. I should be ashamed to let Jim or Ida know that I had been such a beast. I shall say nothing to them, said Bess coldly, but I am disappointed in you, Stephen. I know, said the young man humbly. I should have had more self-control. 
but you will not turn your back on me for this, Bess? No, all the same, I can't feel as I did towards you. Let me go away and think, Stephen, and put away that revolver. Marsh Carr nodded and slipped the weapon into his pocket, but he made no attempt to detain Bess. She went away with a sore heart. End of chapter 17《Chapter Eighteen of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part of the Truth. While Bess was thus employed, her colleague had his hands full in London. On arriving at Paddington, Herrick drove directly to the West Kensington flat. It was closed, and the porter explained that Mr. Joyce had been away for some weeks. "'Ah, that is a pity,' said Dr. Jim, with a grim smile. "'I wish to see him most particularly.' "'I expect him back shortly, sir,' said the man. "'Ah, has he written to fix the date of his return?' "'Not yet, sir, but Mr. Joyce never remains away more than a month or two. "'He may change his habits this time.' "'I don't think so, sir. Shall I tell him you called, sir?' "'No.' You need not go so far as that. When he comes home, just send a wire to that address, and this is for yourself. The porter, a venal creature in uniform, looked at the half-sovereign and the address of the Gulf Hotel in Jeremy Street. He promised faithfully to send a wire the moment Mr. Joyce returned, and Dr. Jim went away, very well satisfied that he had done right in having Robin watched. "'Damn little scoundrel!' growled Herrick. "'What is the use of sparing him? "'But that he is in the hands of a stronger villain? "'I would lay him by the heels straight off. "'But I shall deal with Santiago this time. "'I expect he and Joyce are plotting together in some hole.' "'In another hour Herrick was climbing a flight of dingy stairs "'in the neighborhood of the Strand. "'He stopped at the second landing.' and before a door which bore the name of Kid Belcher and Company, Private Inquiry Office. On entering, he was confronted by a dirty, undersized boy. Kid was absent on business, but Belcher was in, and on giving his card, Dr. Jim was shown into the next room. Here at a table near the window sat a man. That is, he stood on two legs. He was neatly dressed, and he talked in a prim, precise voice. But going by his face, he was a ferret. The long face and nose, the broad forehead and small receding chin, and above all, the red-rimmed eyes without eyebrows or eyelashes. All this made him look very much like a ferret. And his nature was also of the beast. He was a sly, silent, cunning tracker, relentless when once he had hunted down his prey. A dangerous man, a deadly man, who had elected to place himself on the side of the law as offering the better price. Had he chosen to be one of the great criminal profession, Mr. Belcher would have been a dangerous opponent to the police. Luckily, he found that honesty paid better than roguery. Therefore, he was at the disposal of Dr. Jim for the watching of Santiago and Joyce. He talked freely on this point. "'It's all right, sir,' he said, in his whispering voice and arranging his neat white tie. Kidd caught him at the Paddington station and followed him to Pimlico. "'Oh, he is in Pimlico, is he?' "'Watched by three boys and Kidd himself. Four kids, I call them,' said Mr. Belcher, with a silent laugh. "'You see, sir, that Mexican jet prefers to live at Pimlico because it is near the gambling club. We need not mention names, sir, as I have an interest in that club and don't want the police to know of it. I hunt with the hounds and run with the fox, you see. And Belcher gave another of his silent laughs. Hm, said Jim, taking no notice of the joke. So Joyce is at Santiago's lodgings, is he? Drove straight there from Paddington and has not been out of doors since. 
The Don has been, sir. He never thinks you are after him. I fancy he has rather a contempt for my brains, said Jim. However, we shall see about that. I'll go to those lodgings. Would you mind telling me what the Mexican has done, sir? I would mind very much, Mr. Belcher. When I want to tell you my business, you won't have to help me. It's a private matter, but later on there may be something in it likely to pay you. At present all I want you to do is keep an eye on Joyce and Santiago. I will pay you well for it. Yes, sir, thank you, sir. Excuse my curiosity. Quite professional. No doubt. But you will make more money by asking no questions. If things are as I suspect with these two, it will put a lot of cash into your pockets. Meanwhile, hold your tongue. Very good, Dr. Herrick said the ferret meekly, so long as you know your business. I don't need to teach it to you. But you know our firm. We are straight. So long as you are paid. Otherwise, you prefer to keep gambling saloons unknown to the police. Oh, never fear, man. I shall say nothing. By the way, lend me a revolver. Ha, ah, said the ferret, with sudden interest. Is it as bad as that? I think so. One at least of the two will show fight, and it won't be the man you followed from Paddington. You had better come with me, Belcher. I want to know if the coast is clear. If the two catch sight of me from the window, they may clear out. While I am talking to them, you and Kid can remain outside. If you hear a shot, rush up with the nearest policeman. But I won't fire unless I am driven to it. "'Going to shoot one of them, Dr. Herrick?' said Belcher, producing a very serviceable weapon which Jim slipped into his breast pocket. "'Not unless either one draws on me. It is the Mexican, I fear. But it is more likely I shall only fire the revolver by way of a signal. You know what you have to do?' "'Yes, sir,' said the ferret, with something of admiration in his whisper. "'You ought to have been in our profession, doctor.' You provide against every chance. Except sudden death, laughed Jim as they went down the dingy stairs. I have a tough article to deal with in that Santiago. Do you know anything about him, Belcher? The ferret shook his head and waved the neat umbrella at a passing hansom. Not much, sir, he replied. He's been in England over six months and always in the same lodgings. He has money, but not too much of it. I got to know him at the club, and he gambled so high and won so much that I made it my business to look after him. But I could find out nothing to get the whip hand on him, sir. Mr. Joyce goes to your club also? Yes, sir. I told you so when you called to see me first. I knew the name at once. Kid knows him, too, but he doesn't know Kid. That was why I sent Kid to Paddington. He's a fool, sir. True enough, replied Herrick dryly, but even a fool can become dangerous in the hands of an unscrupulous scoundrel like Santiago. Oh, I do not know anything against him, added Herrick, seeing the ferret's eyes twinkle. I'm only going by the little I do know. Not enough to jail him, I suppose, sir. Not yet, but there might be soon, replied Jim, glancing sideways at his neat companion. He well knew that Belcher and Kidd liked to know secrets in order to extort blackmail, a dangerous pair, but Jim knew how to deal with them. They were rather afraid of Jim. He knew too much. Herrick had become acquainted with the ferret through having saved the life of his small daughter, and as this child was the apple of the man's eye, he adored Jim and was in the habit of speaking to him more freely than he otherwise would have done. Therefore, Jim got to know more about the private inquiry firm than was altogether wise. However, he could keep his mouth shut, and, as at present, he sometimes found the pair useful. But the connection was not a pleasant one, even so. And Herrick was wont to comfort himself with the reflection that when dirty work has to be done, no man can be nice in the choice of his instruments. Directed by the ferret, 
the cab stopped at the corner of a Pimlico street in a quiet neighborhood. There he left the doctor in the cab and went along to reconnoiter. In ten minutes he came back. The Mexican has gone out, said Belcher. He has been away an hour. But Joyce is in the sitting room. Kid saw his face two or three times at the window. If you creep along the street under the house, he won't be able to see you. Right you are, said Dr. Jim, climbing down and paying off the cab lavishly because he did not want a disturbance. You wait outside, both of you, and keep an eye on the policeman. When you hear a shot... You needn't tell me twice, Dr. Herrick, said Belcher, his professional pride wounded. Off you go, sir. I'll stop hereabouts and whistle if the Mexican comes along. He doesn't know my real business. Jim nodded and walked along to number 43, where, as Belcher told him, Santiago had rooms on the first floor. On the opposite side of the street, he saw a kid with a green shade and picturesquely attired in rags playing the part of a pavement artist. At the end of the street, three or four boys were playing marbles. No one would suspect that either man or boys were spies. Jim fingered his revolver and rang the bell. "'I want to see Mr. Joyce,' he said to the slattern, who opened the door. "'My name is Nuttall. I come from Don Manuel Santiago.' The slattern, suspecting nothing from this calm address, conducted Jim up the stairs. She opened the door and gave the message to Robin. Herrick heard his voice telling her to show in Mr. Nuttall, and he guessed from the sound of it that Joyce was uneasy. The slattern pushed Jim to the door and then dropped downstairs rapidly. She wanted to get back to her novel, for her mistress was away for the afternoon. "'Well, Joyce, how are you?' Robin gave kind of a squeal, like that of a trapped animal, and fell back into the chair from which he had risen to welcome Mr. Nuttall. His face grew white, his jaw dropped, and he collapsed into a limp heap. Fright so paralyzed his tongue that he could not speak. Jim smiled politely and closed the door. Then he took a chair opposite to the wretched creature. "'You are a proper little scoundrel,' he said in writhing tones. "'I am sorry to see you brought so low as this, Joyce.' "'What do you want?' cried Robin flaming into sudden fury. Have you not humiliated me enough, but that you must come after me, to find you in hiding with Don Manuel? Go easy, Joyce, and keep a civil tongue in your head. I'd like to kill you, he muttered, his face distorted with fury. I have no doubt you would, and I have also small doubt, but that your friend Santiago will try. Do you want to see him? And you, yes. You told me such lies at Saxham, coached by Don Manuel, I suppose, that I wish to talk to the two of you together. If you don't leave this place, I will call the police. Do so by all means. I shall give you in charge when they appear. Come, Joyce, don't be a fool. You have to sit down and do what I tell you. Joyce resumed his seat and bit his fingers. Santiago will kill you, he muttered viciously. I hope he will. Thank you. I see pity is wasted on a reptile like you. But see here, said Jim, with sudden fierceness, I am prepared for you and for the Mexican also. I have only to fire this, he showed the revolver, and the detectives who are waiting will come up. Detectives, cried Joyce, white as snow and trembling. Yes, you fool. I gave you every chance to clear yourself. You abused my leniency and plotted with Santiago to cheat me. This time you will not get off so easy. I wonder how you will like being in the dock on a charge of conspiracy. It's, it's, it's a lie. It's the truth and you know it. You and Santiago wished to get the money left by Colonel Carr. You tried to murder Stephen in the churchyard. It was not I, gasped Robin, shaking with fright. I was with the Miss Endicotts all the time. Oh, I know that your accomplice is the bolder villain. It was he, here Herrick made a shot in the dark, 
It was Santiago who struck Marsh. I know he did, sobbed Joyce, falling into the trap, but I... Never mind about yourself, said Jim, exulting in having extorted this piece of information. Tell me, what is there between Santiago and Corn that made him force the parson to tell a lie in order to prove his alibi? Corn said that Manuel was with him all the evening. You know that is false. Manuel went out and struck Stephen Marsh. I don't know what power Santiago has over Corn, said Robin, wiping his eyes. He never told me, but he has some. He treats me like a dog, and I can't call my soul my own. You poor little rat, said Herrick, with a certain pity. Then the best thing you can do is to come back to me and tell me all you know about this scoundrel. No, no, whimpered Joyce, he would kill me. Not he. I shall know how to save you, and if you do not tell me, said Dr. Jim, in a sharp tone, I'll have you arrested as being concerned in this murder of Colonel Carr. I'm innocent. You know I'm innocent. I know nothing of the sort, replied Herrick unexpectedly. I have your word for it, and your confession of your doings on that night. But there is quite enough in that confession, signed by yourself, mind, to justify you being arrested on suspicion of having committed the crime. Do you think a jury would believe in your story, especially as I can prove that the pistol with which, as I verily believe, the crime was committed was in your possession? I got it from Santiago. So you said, and yet at the time you told me it was out of my power to question the man. You knew that he had gone up to town by the Heathcroft line, and you did not tell me. I was afraid he forced me to hold my tongue. You had better be a little more afraid of me. I can do you more mischief than Don Manuel is likely to do. He will have sufficient to do to look after himself. But I knew what a slippery little devil you were, Joyce, and so I had you watched from the moment you disembarked at the Paddington station. You can't move a step now without my knowledge. So you need not try to give me the slip again. By this time Joyce was in a state of collapse. He saw that Herrick had been too clever for him. Between his fear of Santiago and his fear of Herrick, he was in a pitiable state of mind. Dr. Jim felt sorry for the miserable creature, in spite of the contempt which his conduct righteously provoked. "'I'll tell you what I can,' said Joyce, after a pause. "'I think you are wise. You expect Santiago back soon?' "'At five o'clock.' It's a quarter past four now, said Herrick, glancing at his watch. I will wait for him. He is dangerous, said Joyce, alarmed, and rising from his chair. So am I. It is not a man like me who is afraid of a Mexican greaser. Mr. Joyce, don't go near that window. You'll be making signals to your friend. I don't trust you. On my honor, began Joyce, returning to his seat. You haven't got any. Now then. Why did Santiago try to get Marsh killed? He did not want to kill him. He only desired that he should be disabled and prevented from going to the vault. Herrick whistled. Ah! He has been looking up the will at Doctor's Commons. Well, what does he expect to gain by the money going to Frisco? The man is in communication with him, I suppose. No, said Joyce sulkily. He is in communication with me. The devil! Herrick sprang to his feet. So you put that cipher in the paper, asking Frisco to meet you at Hyde Park Corner? Yes, I did. I put it in the first and the second. Who taught you the cipher? It was one the Colonel Carr knew. Santiago taught it to me. Ah, now we're getting at the truth, said Herrick. And where did you meet Santiago, may I ask? No lie this time, please. I met him at the gambling club in this district. Oh, you did? I never knew that gambling was a vice of yours. It seems one never does know a man. I thought better of you. Well, and for what reason did Santiago tell you about this cipher? I knew him before I went on the walking tour with you. 
When I came back to London, I went to the club and saw him there. He talked about the murder of Carr, and had seen my name as one of the men who found the body. In one way and another, he got everything out of me. The story you told me? Yes, he made me tell everything. Clever man, said Herrick, with a nod, but of course you are so weak, poor soul, that you would tell everything. I now see how this man got you into his power. Well, and why did he teach you the cipher? It seems he knew Frisco. Oh, he denied that. I knew that was a lie, but no matter. I said that Frisco was in London, and that I should like to find him. I wanted to know if Frisco had really killed Colonel Carr. Oh, Herrick shrugged his shoulders. And we're on simple enough to think that Frisco would tell you? He did tell me. That he was innocent, of course. Yes, that he was innocent. But if he had told me that he was guilty, I could not have betrayed him. Oh, said Dr. Jim, with a sharp glance, you are getting more mysterious every moment. Well, so you put in that cipher, the first, by the direction of the Mexican? Yes, and met Frisco at Hyde Park Corner. I also put in the second when I wanted to see Frisco again. He wouldn't give me his address, but said if I wanted to see him, I was to communicate by the cipher. I did not meet him the second time, because I saw you waiting to catch us. Ah, that was clever of you. Of you, too, said Joyce. How did you learn the cipher? That is my business. Be civil, said Dr. Jim sharply. Go on. You saw this man, you say, and he told you he was innocent, which is a lie. I suppose Santiago saw him also. Yes, we were all three in my flat. Nice party, said Dr. Jim sarcastically. And you made up this conspiracy between the lot of you? Yes, we wanted Marsh to lose the money. I do not see where the advantage would come in, said Dr. Jim reflectively. The money would go to Frisco, certainly. But he could not benefit without running the risk of arrest. He was not to appear at all in the matter, explained Joyce. When the money came to him, he was to feign death and make a will leaving the fortune to me. I was to share it with him and Santiago. Herrick stared. The conspiracy was more complicated than he had thought, and very cunning, too. Upon my word, that is clever, he said in a tone, half of jest and half admiration, although I do not see exactly how the law would look at the matter. Frisco wanted for murder, to feign death, fortune left to you, money to be shared between the presumed corpse and two plotters left alive? Why, it's like a melodrama. You would have had some difficulty in proving the death of Frisco, though. Oh, Santiago was going to manage that, said Joyce, with confidence. I'm sure he would, even to going the length as making a real corpse of the man after the will was signed. Joyce jumped up and began to walk up and down, much agitated. No, he said, bad as you think me, Herrick, I should never have consented to Frisco being put out of the way. The death would have been proved without that. Frisco would have received his share of the money. He would have gone free. I would rather die myself than anything should happen to Frisco. Yes, you may look. I would. Dr. Jim shrugged his shoulders. Your conscience has grown very tender all of a sudden. That you should desire to shield a scoundrel? Is Frisco a relative of yours? That you should be so careful of his skin? Joyce dropped into a seat and looked straight at the doctor. Frisco is my father, he said deliberately. Dr. Jim jumped up in his turn and stared down at the pinched white face. He could scarcely believe his ears. Your father? he gasped. Is this another part of your conspiracy? It is the truth, said Joyce simply, so simply, that Herrick was convinced that for once he was telling no lie. When he met me and came to my flat, he told me he was my father. I did not believe him, but he soon convinced me by showing me my mother's letters. Addressed to him where? Colonel Carr's. 
Oh, Herrick dropped back into his chair. So this accounts for the annuity. What is your father's real name? Joyce, the same as mine. He was Colonel Carr's cousin. Herrick was amazed and remembered what he had heard about the uncle of the wicked Colonel. Carr's father turned a son out of doors, he muttered. The son went to America and married. He had one daughter. My mother, she was the Carr's cousin, not my father's. I am getting confused, murmured Joyce, feeling his head. In that case, you are cousin to Stephen Marsh. Yes, and I should have the money, since my grandfather was the brother of Colonel Carr. That is why I conspired, as you called it. That was why my father and Santiago tried to help me get my rights. What do you think of it now, Herrick? I think that you went the wrong way to work, said Jim. That is, if you are telling me the truth, which I doubt. It is the truth, cried Joyce, clenching his fist. If you do not believe me, he added, listening for a moment, here is one who will tell you. Santiago, said Herrick, rising to be ready for emergencies. Yes, he's coming up the stair now. At that moment, there was a shrill whistle outside. Belcher's signal. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Don Manuel's Recollections. Santiago entered the room quite unsuspiciously. His step was light, his eyes were bright, and he had evidently been successfully plotting some new and lucrative villainy. In a moment his astonished eyes lighted upon Herrick, standing tall and smiling on the hearth-rug. A Spanish oath of the coarsest slipped from his mouth, and he looked about as evil as a man can look who knows that the game is up. However, he was plucky enough to show fight. He even attempted a bluff. "'What are you doing in my room, senor?' he demanded, in Spanish, if you... "'Don't you think we had better keep to English?' said Herrick, blandly. I know you speak it so well, and, of course, we have our mutual friend Joyce to consider. You are surprised to see me? Natural, very natural. Joyce sat in his chair, silent and white. He was too frightened to open his mouth, for he knew something of Don Manuel's rages, and dreaded the tornado which would ensue when the Mexican learned how Herrick had been told everything by his weak-kneed coadjutor. For a moment Santiago, still in ignorance as to the true state of affairs, ground his teeth. Then, by an effort of will, he recovered his smile, and to all appearances his usual temper. "'You'll excuse me if I spoke rudely, senor,' he said with a polite bow. "'It is not my custom. But I am rather taken aback at meeting you here. I do not remember having asked you to come.' That's all right, replied Jim cheerfully. He did not sit down, for Santiago was still on his feet, and one can use a revolver better when standing. I heard that you had been suddenly called to town yesterday. I therefore made it my business to follow. Very kind of you, said Santiago, slipping his hand into his breast pocket, an action which was imitated by Herrick. But how did you find out my address? I never gave it to you. "'An oversight on your part, my dear Don Manuel,' replied Jim, politely, but watchful of the man's slightest action. "'But the fact is my friend Joyce left Beelminster yesterday, as you know. That was after his talk with you, I believe. I thought it was possible you might ask him to stop with you for a day or so in place of returning to his own home. Therefore I telegraphed to town, asking certain friends of mine to keep a watch on him, and you. What am I to understand from all this, senor? This much, that your game is up. Joyce has told me much. I have waited to see if you will tell me more. Don Manuel cast a black look at Robin, who began to whimper. I could not help it, he said. It's all over. I had to tell him. 
"'You told him what?' demanded the Mexican, livid with rage. "'All about the conspiracy, Frisco, and a few others. Ah! Would you, for Don Manuel, had whipped out his revolver. Herrick was just as quick, and the two men faced one another. Robin gave a shriek like a frightened woman. The sight was an unpleasant one. "'For God's sakes!' cried Joyce, wringing his hands. "'One moment before you fire, senor,' said Herrick coolly. "'I would have you know that the firing of a single shot will bring up the police.' Santiago dropped his revolver with a start. "'The police,' he muttered. Then, after a pause, he returned his weapon to his pocket. "'You can do the same, senor,' he said calmly. "'I don't think we shall have much use for them,' said Herrick putting away his weapon and sitting down. I think we may talk now that these preliminaries are ended. Will you not be seated, Señor Manuel? In my own house, exclaimed the Spaniard, between his teeth, but sat nevertheless. Quite so, I have to ask you pardon for that. But you see, my friend, I must stand if you do, and I am tired. You might use that pretty little weapon in your pocket. I may do so yet, said Santiago, with an ugly look. Possibly. All the same, I would point out that your intention has its disadvantages. In the first place, I am good and a quick shot. In the second, as my shot or yours would summon the police, you might get into trouble. The police can do nothing to me. If you attempt to kill me, I think they can do a lot. We are not in Mexico now, Señor Santiago. Come, let us talk sensibly. I am sure you must see that I am in a position to dictate my own terms. You will not find them hard, I assure you, always provided. Provided what? That you did not murder Colonel Carr. If you did, I fear, I fear I shall be obliged to hand you over to the police. We have a prejudice against people being killed in this country, Don Manuel. Oh, curse your fine speeches, growled the Don. I did not kill Carr, if that is what you are driving at. He paused and cast a look at Joyce. I see that you have got the better of me. If that white-livered cur had held his tongue, however, I must make the best of a bad job. Come, if I answer your questions freely and frankly, will you promise not to inform the police of what I tell you? No, I can't promise that. If you know where Frisco is, you must tell me. I want to have that man hanged. Joyce started up with a cry. I'm sorry, Robin, if he is your father, but as he is a murderer also, he must. One moment, interposed Santiago coolly. Frisco is no murderer. Indeed, then, as you were in possession of the pistol with which Colonel Carr was shot, "'Perhaps you can tell me who used it. "'That is,' said Herrick significantly, "'if you did not use it yourself.' "'I don't use weapons of that sort,' said Santiago scornfully. "'Besides, it was my game to frighten Carr, not to kill him.' "'I see. It was you who sent those warnings in cipher.' "'You know that, do you? "'Yes, it was I. "'And to make Carr afraid. "'He had few good nights after he got those warnings, I know.' They were all bluff. So far as I was concerned, replied Santiago easily, but had I chosen, they could have been sent in deadly earnest. I do not understand. I do not think you will until I explain. But first, I must be assured of my own safety before I speak. Well, said Dr. Jim, pulling out his pipe, it's this way, you see. I want to get to the bottom of this conspiracy, also to learn who killed Carr. I could have you arrested on the charge of trying to kill Marsh. Here the Mexican muttered a curse on Robin's head, and the little man winced. But if you will prove to me that you did not kill Carr, and tell me the whole truth, why, I will let you go back to Mexico unharmed. And if I refuse, demanded Don Manuel, in that case, I'll call up the police and give you and Joyce in charge for conspiracy and assault with intent to kill. I did not wish to kill him, protested Manuel. I only wanted to prevent him going to the vault. 
and so allow the money to pass to frisco put in herrick very clever i know all about that tell me something new if i had only been here before you intimidated this you would have done as he has done said herrick then changing his tone he spoke sharply we are wasting time tell me all i want to know answer my questions and you shall go free save that i shall have you watched until the true murderer of colonel carr has been found if you refuse you shall be arrested forthwith and if i were to shoot you cried santiago savagely half rising you would be hanged or else you would have to end your own life don't i tell you the sound of the shot will bring up the men i have posted santiago reflected for a moment then took out his revolver and tossed it carelessly on to the table you are the stronger, senor. I give in. Allow me to roll a cigarette, and I will answer all your questions. I'm not afraid, for I can swear by the Holy Mother that I did not kill Carr, and, added Santiago with a gay laugh, I rather regret I did not. Come, said Herrick, lighting his pipe. The story. In the first place, where did you meet Colonel Carr? In Mexico, about twenty years ago. You would not think it to look at me, but I am not young, Senor Herrick. Did you meet Frisco at the same time? Joyce's father, I did. Wait a moment, said Robin. I wanted to tell Herrick the precise relationship between myself and Colonel Carr, but I grew confused. Was not my mother his niece? I forget. I am so muddled. No, it is this way. The uncle of Colonel Carr a younger brother of his father was turned out of doors by the grandfather he went to the states and married he died leaving a widow and a daughter the widow died and the daughter married an american your father was the son and he married your mother you are their son therefore you were a kind of third or fourth cousin the car your father frisco was a second cousin i think it is this way but santiago shrugged his shoulders your english relationships are so very confusing cousins will do said herrick did carr know that frisco we will continue to call him so as it is rather confusing did carr i say know that frisco was his second cousin yes for that reason he allowed mrs joyce an annuity of five hundred a year why was it not continued to our friend here Don Manuel laughed. I think the Colonel and Frisco had quarreled by then, and Carr had told him to look after his own brat. How dare you, cried Robin, jumping up. My friend, I repeat what the Colonel said, that is all. Herrick interposed. Did Mrs. Joyce know that Frisco was with Carr? Oh, dear me, no. She thought she was a widow. That is true, said Robin gloomily. My mother always said, that my father had died in america i could not believe that frisco was my father until he convinced me i think we both convinced you said the mexican with a laugh but it strikes me dr herrick that we are beginning the story at the wrong end let me tell it my own way it will be much clearer i hope it will be true oh as to that i have no reason to conceal anything now said don manuel with a shrug you may as well know all. The money is lost, and I shall return to Mexico as poor as I set out. Well? Tell the story in your own way, growled Herrick, disliking the coolness of the man, yet half admiring his nerve. Well then, said Santiago, placing a cigarette in his mouth and crossing his legs, it is this way. Twenty years ago I met Colonel Carr. He was in the war between Chile and Peru, and a brave soldier he was, a brute also. There was nothing he would not do to get money. He had left his home a pauper, and he swore he would go back a millionaire. But when the war was at an end, he had not got the fortune he wanted. It was about that time that Frisco fell in with Carr. And Frisco introduced himself as a cousin? Just that, said Santiago briskly. They soon found out the relationship. Joyce, I am speaking of your father, my friend. This in an aside to Robin. Joyce came from San Francisco. 
So the colonel one day being drunk called him Frisco, and the name stuck to him. After that they were what you English call pals, and hung round Lima trying to make money. I was in the army then, and saw much of them. Frisco was as anxious as Carr to be rich. He said he had left a wife and son in California. That was you, Robin, put in Herrick, much interested. Yes, that was Robin, said Don Manuel, with a sour glance at the little man whom he had not yet forgiven for his cowardly confession. Well, senor, the two tried to make money and could not. Then they heard of the treasures buried by the Indians when Pizarro conquered Peru. They went off to Cusco, afterwards up into the mountains. For some months they were gone. One day they came back to Lima to see me, ragged and poor. They had caught an Indian who knew of a large treasure in gold and jewels. He told them where it was hidden, and gave them a plan. But I thought the Indians would not tell, said Herrick, who knew something of the country of which Santiago was speaking. This one did, said the Mexican with a smile. They tortured him with a red-hot gun barrel. Don't look so astonished, senor. Indians are not much above the beasts, and I told you Carr was a devil. They tortured him till he gave them the plan. Carr was afraid of losing it, so he made Frisco tattoo it on his breast, and then burnt the original plan. Ah, Herrick started to his feet. I see now why Carr wanted his body watched for a year. At the end of that time, the plan would not be recognizable, finished Santiago quietly. Exactly so, senor. Carr knew from the ciphers I sent him that I was in the country and would in some way try to get sight of that plan. For that, he shut himself up in the tower and... Wait a bit, said Herrick. He built that tower when he came home ten years ago. Your coming did not make him build it. He knew that someone would come and try to kill him, said Don Manuel coolly. But I am telling the end before the beginning. Let me go on. Well, Dr. Herrick, as I said, Colonel Carr had that plan tattooed on his breast. He would not show it to me, but he wanted me to join in an expedition to get the treasure. I got the money and fitted out the expedition. We started off to Cuzco, then up to Aparimac, and on the mountains. I told you something of this before, senor. On the way they betrayed me into the hands of some Indians, and went on themselves. I cursed my fate when I learned their treachery. I was held captive for two, three years. To revenge myself on Carr, I told the Indians how he had found the treasure. They were furious and sent out men to protect it. But Carr fought them and got away to the coast with a quantity of jewels and gold. He went to the States and afterwards came on to England, where he settled down at the Pines. But at Lima he was twice nearly assassinated, and he knew that the Indians had appointed some of their more civilized countrymen to follow and kill him and to cut the plan of the hiding place out of his flesh. He knew also that these appointed would follow him across the water to the ends of the earth but he managed to give them the slip, and never thought that in an obscure country village he would be in danger. All the same, he built a tower that he might keep himself safe while asleep. "'And are you one of these emissaries?' asked Herrick. Santiago shook his head. "'I might have been, had I so chosen,' said he. "'But I wanted a share of the money myself, or at all events, a plan of the hiding place, that I might search for it. How did you hear all this? When you were a captive? I did not then. It was when I got back to Lima that I heard. I could not learn where Carr had gone. I did not know even if Carr was his real name. I hunted for him both in North and South America, but he had so cleverly concealed his trail that I could not trace him. Then I was ill for a long time after the privations I had suffered amongst the Indians. It was only within the last year that I discovered the whereabouts of Carr. I then came to England to frighten him, so I sent those cipher warnings. I wanted a share of the money or the plan. Carr refused to give me either. 
Ah, you saw him then? No, he wrote me a letter defying me to do my worst. Of course he thought that I was one of those appointed to kill him. That was why he lived in the tower and arranged that his body should be watched after his death. Dead or alive, you see, he was determined that I should get nothing. You came down to Saxon to break into the vault, suggested Herrick. No, I should have done so had I not hit upon this other plan, which you call the conspiracy. But I thought that through this little fool. I might get the money. I deserved it more than Stephen Marsh. There was a silence for a few minutes. Santiago was regretting the downfall of his hopes. Robin was wondering about his own future, and Dr. Jim reflected on the strange story which had been told to him. Did you never go down to Saxon? he asked. Oh, yes, senor, replied the Mexican airily. On the night when Colonel Carr was murdered, I was at the rectory. With Pentland Corn, said Herrick. Then you knew him before. I know him better than anyone in his parish knows him, said Santiago. He's a gambler. Often he leaves his church to come to the Pimlico Club and gamble. It was there that I met him. He was the friend I spoke of when I first saw you, Senor Herrick, the friend who told me about Colonel Carr. As I had the secret of this padre, I used him as an intermediator between myself and Carr. Herrick was surprised to hear this about Corn, and could easily see how the unfortunate man had been kept under the thumb of this adventurer. "'You are certainly skillful in finding tools,' said he, dryly, and with a glance at the silent Joyce. "'So you were at the rectory on that night. How can I be sure that you were not at the Pines?' "'Oh, you want to accuse me of the murder?' said Don Manuel, rather amused. I assure you I did not kill Carr. It was not my aim to do so. I wished to get the money without danger from your laws. To be plain, senor, I went to Pentland Corn to see if he could bribe or force Frisco into betraying Carr into my hands. I came to Bealminster by a late train and went to Saxham by the public coach. About nine I came to the rectory. The Reverend Corn was out but I waited for him. He could not have been out, said Herrick. Mrs. Marsh was with him, and her son had come to fetch her. You are right, except as to the time, senor. Mrs. Marsh had gone by nine, and her son also. Corn came back and said that he had taken them to the public conveyance. He was pale and looked haggard. I told him he lied. He lost his nerve and threw on the table a pistol. Ha! Ah, the pistol you gave to Joyce? The same, replied Santiago coolly, the weapon with which Carr was murdered. Do you mean to say that Corn killed the colonel? cried Herrick, starting to his feet. It is a lie. I do not believe it. Then why ask me to tell you the truth? It was Corn who killed Carr. He was a gambler and deeply in the colonel's debt. Those visits he paid to the Pines were not to convert Carr, as he alleged, but to gamble with him. He lost much money to Carr. The colonel threatened, if he did not pay, to denounce him. Corn knew that he would lose his position if this was done. He knew also that Carr was a threatened man. I had told him. It then occurred to him to kill Carr, and he thought that the suspicion might be shifted on to those who had lost the treasure. Thus, his secret and himself would be safe. It is incredible, said Herrick, and even Joyce looked amazed. It is true, replied the Mexican, of course. If you will not believe me, I cannot really help it. I know that Corn is guilty. He told me so himself, and I took from him the pistol by way of proof. Being thus in my power, I forced him to do my bidding. You can see now how he declared that I had not left him on the night Senor Marsh was assaulted. It was I who struck him, and Corn, by my directions, proved the alibi. That is the whole story, Senor. Is there anything else you want to know? The whereabouts of Frisco. Ah, I can't tell you that. Frisco trusts no one, not even me. When Joyce or myself want to see him, we have to put a cipher into the telegraph. 
Then you must do so now. I want to see the man. Why, he's innocent. So you say. But I have yet to be convinced of Pentland Corn's guilt. Joyce jumped to his feet. I am sure that my father is innocent, he cried. But I will get him to see you if you like. I think it would be better, said Herrick dryly, and took up his hat. One moment, senor, said Santiago quietly. How do we stand? I shall do nothing until I see Corn and learn if he really killed Carr, as you say. In the meantime, Joyce can go back to his flat, and you can remain here, Don Manuel. You are perfectly safe from the police. But you'll have us watched? Certainly, said Herrick with a nod. You see... I cannot trust you. Besides, I want you to write down all you have told me and sign it. I have Joyce's confession. I want yours. I will do so with pleasure, replied the Mexican after a pause. I have done nothing against your law. Nothing except try to kill Marsh. Oh, you have promised to hold me guiltless of that. True enough. You are safe so far as that is concerned. There is honor amongst thieves, Senor Manuel. I have come lately so much into contact with people like you and Joyce that I feel rather a bad lot myself. The Mexican drew himself up and his eyes glittered. Senor, you shall answer me for those words. I'm a gentleman, and I challenge you to a duel. You dare not refuse. We'll see about that when this matter of Carr's death is settled, Don Manuel. Meantime, remember that every move you make I shall know of and baffle. Santiago shrugged his shoulders. The fine scheme is ended, he said. This little fool has spoiled it all. I would do what you wish, senor, since you are too strong for me. Very good. And Joyce, you must get your father to see me. If I can, muttered Robin, with a glance of hatred. You must, answered Herrick, going to the door. Good-bye, gentlemen. I shall leave you to settle your own affairs now. And he went out laughing. End of chapter 19